All right, guys, thank you for being on today. Hey, we have a privilege today of having David Cribs. Um, he's, um, he is the um, owner of Auto Dealer Live, and he has his own radio show and things like that. David, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started in the industry. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. And just to quickly clarify, uh, the show Auto Dealer Live, I co-host that along with David Villa, uh, who owns a marketing company that, uh, that actually sells both uh, digital marketing, sales training, uh, and, uh, and also direct mail campaigns to dealerships across the country. Um, and we, we host that show every single week and talk with some of the most amazing people in the industry, uh, whether it's a dealer, whether it's uh, someone at, in a different position in the finance office, maybe an internet manager, uh, salespeople, uh, vendors that serve the auto industry. So it's a great show um, and, and really excited to, uh, to get to you know, connect with those type of people every single week, week in and week out. So thank you so much, uh, Gary, for bringing that up. So um, actually, I got in the business back in, I'm going to show my age here, but uh, late 1989. So been in the auto industry since literally. And um, I, I have held every position on the what we call the front end of the dealership from salesperson to general manager. And the last 10 years or so, I've been uh, training, consulting, traveling, and uh, spending time with dealers and, and helping them grow their businesses. Cool. Um, so you've seen a lot of changes in that market, correct? A lot of changes. A lot of changes. I mean, you know, we've, we've stepped into this world of technology, which has really, you know, changed the way we do business. Of course, consumers have more information than they've ever had. Mm -hmm. They like moving a lot faster. Uh, than than we used to before. So uh, so yeah, it's a different it's a different uh, kind of look today. Yeah. So I have to bring this up. I have to show you this. Can you see? <laughs> Coffee's <laughs> for closers, baby. Well, that means I'm a great closer then because I have coffee probably ten times a day. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So give us an example, David, of what a, a sales team at a dealership what they should be doing to be successful every day. So let you know some, the, let's go into like the phone calls, who they should be calling, um, types of stuff like that. What, what's the flow of a day for a sales team in a dealership? Well, that's interesting because it looks a little bit different at each dealership when it comes to, uh, when we, especially when we get into the phone part. So I'll kind of separate, but um, you know, each day as a salesperson, when I walk into the dealership, there's sort of a chronological order of the way that I believe I should be doing business or anyone out there who's selling cars should be doing business. And, uh, you know, the first thing when you walk into the, uh, to the store is I, I want to check the lot. I want to walk the lot. I want to see, especially, uh, Gary, if maybe, you know, it's very common in the car business for you to be out early one day and then come in late the next day. So um, maybe you got off at four o'clock and the next day you're in at two, then there's a lot of things that have transpired from between the time that you left the dealership the day before and the time that you return. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is walk the lot. And the reason I'm going to do that is uh, because I want to see if there were any type of inventory changes, because each day when I sit down to place those calls, uh, there are two things that are going on. One is that I should have a list of vehicles that maybe I'm potentially looking for. So if I have been working my prospects and, and doing that through the use of my CRM, which we're going to talk about here in a moment, um, then I need to be up on anything that may have come in. I can't tell you how many times, um, and this has happened to me personally too, back when I was selling, but you know, maybe you've got that, that really difficult uh, vehicle that you probably have two or three prospects for. Maybe it's that cash vehicle under 10 grand that they want a full size truck under 10 grand. Maybe it's the, uh, you know, the uh, dually uh, diesel truck that's so rare uh, to get in on trade. And, you know, you leave at four o'clock and you've got, you know, two or three of those great prospects that's been waiting for a couple weeks to, to, to see if you get that vehicle. And you come in at two o'clock the next day, you don't walk the lot, you go back and get your coffee, you know, you say hello to the crew, um, you go and maybe you do sit down and start making your phone calls or doing something else. And, you know, 
maybe a few minutes later, you get up and you walk across the showroom floor to get a snack or, or look outside and you notice this truck and you go, oh, that's going to be a truck that works for my client, right? The bell goes off. Uh, the only problem is one of the other uh, salespeople is putting a tag on it because they just sold it because it came in the night before on trade. So that's, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about walking the lot. So that's going to be my first step uh, when I walk into the dealership each and every day. Um, it's going to give me a place to go when I sit down to make phone calls because if something has changed, it gives me a real purpose when I reach out to that customer. So, uh, so that would be kind of the first thing. The next thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at any deals that I've been working the last day or two that maybe we're close to putting together. I'm going to revisit those. I'm probably going to convene with my sales manager about where we're at with those deals and see if there's anything we can do to put them together. So that's going to be my step two. So, and, and by the way, when I go through this chronological step, what I'm really trying to do, Gary, is work closest to the money, work closest to the low hanging fruit because that, that is only there for a very short time. So, so those are the first two things I'm gonna do. And then the third thing is I'm gonna get into my CRM. You know, um, I, I gotta tell you, Gary, I interviewed a, a lady who was uh, number two in the country. She was the number two salesperson in the, in the entire country. Wow. Uh, for, yeah, for uh, Nissan. And uh, when I asked her what, you know, hey, how do you do this? You know, what's the secret sauce? Because you're just, you, you're, at, you're selling more cars than I can imagine. And, um, you know, she had one answer and she's like, Dave, it's, it's my CRM. I've, I fell in love with my CRM. I work my CRM and that's how I do it. So, um, so that's going to be the next step in the chronological order after I walk the lot, after I, and by the way, part of walking the lot, let me just share this real quick. Part of walking the lot is I'm not only checking for inventory, but I'm also visiting real quickly the service managers because I want to have a relationship with the service managers on a regular basis. So I'm going back to check with them, see if they need anything, see if I can bring them a cup of coffee instead of myself, right? Um, the reason is they're talking with our best customers every single day, right? The right. service department is a gold mine. And it's funny because you talked earlier, Gary, about the evolution of the car business. And part of that evolution is, has been dealerships discovering the gold mine that they have uh, there in the service department and learning how with all these new technologies, how to mine that data and actually market to the people who are already their clients or coming into the service department. So I want to have a very close relationship with those service riders. So um, when I walk that lot in the morning, that's going to be part of my little uh, uh, normal routine is kind of checking with them to make sure there's, if there's anyone in the service right now that I can talk to, remember that's the low hanging fruit. Right. So I'm working closest to the money. So that's where I kind of begin. And then after I walk the lot, after I go through my deal rehash, as I call it, and, and probably with one of my sales managers, after I do that, then I'm going to go to the CRM. I'm going to plug in there and I'm going to do whatever that CRM tells me to do in the sense that we should have been entering clients every day. And we should have uh, little reminders that pop up and say, hey, I need to call so-and-so today. This is kind of where they're at in the timeline. So, um, so that is going to be kind of the first sort of uh, chronological steps to what a salesperson or a sales team should be doing each day. I hope that kind of helps answer that first question. Absolutely. You know, you talked about the CRM and, you know, I, you know, <laughs> there's a saying that the best CRM to use is the one that you do use. Um, right. <laughs> that's the best one because the, the money is in the follow-up, right? I mean, isn't that correct? The fortune's in the follow-up. The fortune's yeah. in the follow-up. We talk about all the time. And, and Gary, the tough thing is that, and, and I'm one of these people, so I'll confess now, but as a salesperson, uh, the CRM can be a challenge for us because we're more, you know, sales, not organization right. necessarily. A lot right. of our personalities, we're driven to talk to people, but we're not necessarily driven to do data entry. And that's kind of how we see it as salespeople oftentimes. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to get past that and you've got to really figure out how that is going to be a gold mine. You've got to, you've really got to be sold on a CRM before you're going to use it. And in fact, uh, we'll get into the mentality of being sold on things here in a few minutes, but, uh, but you're absolutely right. The fortune's in the follow-up and um, the, the quicker that you can embrace a CRM and get comfortable with it, 
uh, the, the quicker you're going to go to a whole new level. Cool. Awesome stuff. So let's talk about phone calls real quick. So let's talk about what salespeople should do, what they should be calling, who they should be calling, what they should be saying. Let's go through that a little bit. Can you, can you shed some light on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So when I mentioned earlier that, you know, it looks a little different uh, at each store when it comes to this, because um, of course we want to call everyone that we can call, um, but the store typically has a system in which uh, the leads, if you will, come in. And, and oftentimes when I say leads, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that term just as a, as a sake of ease because um, I really like to refer to the leads as customers, clients, people, right? Not just leads. But for the sake of time and, and just reference, we're going to call them leads for the moment. But, um, you know, leads come from a mi many different places. And depending on the store that you're at, depends uh, is going to depend or determine the access that you have to each one of those categories. So for example, um, you know, most stores now do have an internet department. Uh, some call it a BDC, some call it an internet department, doesn't matter. Um, it does look a little bit different at each store. Um, so in some cases, internet people, when I say internet people, I don't, I, again, I, I'm, I'm just, there's probably better terminology for an internet uh, sales representative, but, um, but the point is that anyone who works in the internet department, uh, sometimes the store is set up for that person to get that incoming lead um, or work an outbound lead and really carry it all the way to the point of sale and actually be the salesperson. Um, there are some models that this is very common where you have those who are making the phone calls, scheduling the appointments, and then turning it over to salespeople when they arrive. Uh, there's that model. And then there's the model of, hey, our salespeople really do it all. They take all of the incoming leads, the inbound calls, um, the outbound calls, they kind of do it all. Now that model is getting more and more rare, Gary, uh, simply because you know dealerships are, are becoming a lot like what, what I would uh, kind of give as an analogy is like a football team where we're becoming more and more specialized in each area. And we're getting those people who, you know, are going to have an assignment of, hey, this is the lead for you. This is the lead we want you to be proficient at. Um, and so that all of the leads are handled, they're handled with consistency. The store knows how the lead is being handled, um, all of those things. So, um, so when we get into this uh, kind of idea of what's, you know, who salespeople should be calling or how should they should be handling different leads, it's going to look different at each store. So that being said, let's talk about some of the um, areas of leads that we have. I mean, obviously we have the inbound call, which by the way, Gary, now is probably the strongest, what I call up in the dealership. Um, you know, we, we, when someone walks onto the lot, uh, we typically call that an up, right? Like that's your up, uh, who's up next, that kind of thing. So uh, we refer to them, it's a slang car term, but we refer to, to them as an up. Well, the strongest up now is not necessarily the person walking on the lot like it used to be. It's actually the person that's calling in. And one of the reasons for that, Gary, is because you are so close to choosing now that next step of action be, when you call in. Because as we know, all of this information we talked about being so available for the consumer um, online, they can look and find just about anything that they need to look and find. Um, so, uh, and the average visit now to a dealership, where it used to be, you know, four, five, six, seven trips to or to different dealerships now it's down to i think 1.2 1.3 on average which means that the consumer is more ready than ever uh to purchase when they reach out to you and when they come to that store so uh that phone call and as we know gary people calling are it's gone to a different level it's 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 you know people text they communicate by text by emails by this that when they get to the point where they're actually going to pick up the phone and call you, it's on like Donkey Kong. So that's the strongest, in my opinion, the strongest up that we're going to see is that inbound call. So that's the one we want to place the highest priority on when it comes to the interaction. Um, and then, of course, there's, uh, there's working our leads, sitting down and working not only the people that have been in the store, but, you know, those people that are on our, on our lease list, for example, people that are coming off lease. By the way, this is one of my favorite sort of playground areas for leads 
are those people that are coming off leases because we have a million reasons why we can call them um, and we can get into some of those if we have time, but um, that's another area. Um, another area, of course, are, are the, you know, any, of course, emails that we receive and, of course, any kind of internet chat that's going on, we turn that into an actual physical phone call or conversation, but, uh, but maybe that helps, you know, categorize a few of them, but I'll let you go to the next question. <laughs> well, that's great. So an outbound call, those people, David, I want to elaborate a little more on this. Sure, an sure. outbound call would be somebody that expressed an interest, say, a month ago, um, somebody that expressed an interest a couple of days ago. And what does that call look like? So can you go through and tell us what that call looks like? Like maybe just... You know, talk about a script on, you know, hey, Mr. Jones, you know, this, uh, I saw that you, um, you know, were, had an interest in this, this, this. Can you go through, because I think that that's going to be really helpful for um, dealerships and, and salesmen on what they should say and what they shouldn't say. Can you, do you mind touching on that? I would love to touch on that. You know, um, when you mentioned, though, that outbound call, someone that maybe had expressed interest a few days ago or maybe a month ago, um, Hopefully that outbound call when they express that interest happened immediately in right. real time. Now, oftentimes that's not the case, unfortunately, but in most dealerships now we are set up or should be set up to respond really, really quickly. In fact, typically the first person to respond is going to have the highest odds of have capturing that customer or that lead. So again, you're talking about, in this case, you're talking about a customer that's already expressed interest in our product. I mean, that's huge, right? right. So before we pick up the phone, and I, and, and I wanna address this, because this is really the basics before we even make that phone call, is that we have to understand that when we make a phone call, we're, we are making a phone call to make a sale. We are making a phone call to make a sale. Now, we're not trying to sell the car, so let's not confuse that. And most dealerships now have that mentality, mentality and they understand that we're not trying to sell the car. What we are trying to sell is the appointment, right? And in the old days, when someone would call up or you would call out, um, the, 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 the method to get them in your store um, was to lowball them 90% of the time, right? If they called about a car, and you knew that you know you couldn't take a dime less than 25 grand on that car. You tell them, oh yeah, I think we'd probably get down somewhere in the low 22s, maybe 23. Come see us, right? Well, now no matter where they go, they're not going to get that deal. So yeah, they're going to show up. They're going to show up. It's going to be up to you to try to figure <laughs> out your way out of that, right? And that used to be the norm, Gary. That was the norm. But remember why it was the norm. It was the norm very much in part because it was a different business model back then. Again, that was when people drove around from dealer to dealer and went to five or six dealers before they moved forward because we had all the information and the only way they could get any information was to visit every store and try to figure out which one was gonna you know, treat them the best, I guess. But um, so going back to this idea of making a sale, right? We know that we're going to have to sell the appointment. We're going to have to make the appointment. That is our whole goal uh, in the phone call. So I want to go over a couple of do's and don'ts. Um, one of the don'ts, and this is big, um, and wait, let me, let, me, let me backtrack just for a moment. Um, when I mentioned that we have to make a sale, the first rule in sales for me, bar none, no matter what, and by the way, it's my number one sales tip of, of, of anything I could offer any salesperson. And my number one sales tip is before you make a sale, you have to be sold. You have to be, you personally have to be sold. So I know when I pick up the phone, I've got to be sold on the appointment. I've got to be sold on the why. I've got to be sold on my, my unique selling proposition, whatever that might be. I've got to be sold on my process. I've got to be sold on those things. So I'm going to say, if you're not at that point, don't pick up the phone. Don't pick up the phone. Go, go back and try to figure out how to get sold. And if you need to talk to, uh, this is why we have teams, why we have managers, why we have processes. You know, if you're not sold on some of those things, you need to go back and find out why. And, you know, you don't, what you don't want to do is go to your boss and go, you know what? No, I think this sucks, man. I don't know about this. That's not a way to get sold or ask for help, right? Um, all right, what you, all right, all right, all right. 
All right, I'm, I'm, I've got to ask this question. I'm sorry. Sure. What sure. do you mean by being sold? I'm a little confused. Okay, so, okay. So what, what do I have to be? What do you mean by being sold? What, what, can you elaborate on that? Because I'm a little confused. I think I know what you mean, but there's some people that probably don't. So what do you mean by being sold? I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, you know, there's some things we need to be sold on when we reach out to that client. Okay, when we reach out to that client, by the way, what's going to happen? We're going to call them up, whether it's a script or not. What is actually going to take place on the phone? We're going to try to talk them into getting to our store, right? So if I'm going to try to talk you into doing anything and, um, and uh, I'm going to, you know, I know I'm a little all over the place, but um, what, again, when I use that terminology, I don't really like the terminology I just use, but what, it, it kind of gives the message when I'm trying to talk right. you into something, right? Um, so when I'm trying to talk you into something, I've got to have a conviction. I've got to be compelled. I've got to know that that is already something that I believe in. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about getting sold. So for example, when you're reaching out to a client, um, you have, you need that what they need is they need process. They need to have, uh, something in them that gives them a compelling reason to come to your store. And by the way, the compelling reason isn't the free oil change or the, whatever it is, it, it's gotta be a connection and a real legitimate reason. So let's go back to an example so that we can hopefully clarify. So, uh, we talked about earlier about, um, that, uh, that truck, right? That, that all elusive uh, $10,000 car or that truck, right? So now what I look at that truck, I want to go outside and feel it, touch it, whatever the case may be, and, and get myself sold mentally on that truck. So that when I pick up the phone and I go, Hey, Mr. Smith, Hey, look, I've got a, uh, I just, I just, I've got great news. We just took in, I know that you were anxious to see one of our uh, a, a truck that was a diesel, long bed, dually, whatever the case may be. Look, we just got one in. It's a and and Mr. Customer says, okay, well, tell me what it is. Is it a two thousand? You know, is it a what year is it? I say, well, it's a two thousand twelve. Uh, how many miles are on it, Dave? Uh, it's got eighty two thousand. No, that's too high, Dave. That's too high. See, we're gonna run into that that objection, right? So so what I'm gonna say, and let me just I'll share this as well. But when it comes to an objection, and we'll get back to a script here in a moment. But when it comes to an objection, number one rule is you need to empathize and agree with that objection. Okay. And also an objection is not a no, by the way, we need to, that's another thing we need to be sold on and we need to internalize an objection is not a no. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Say that again, because that is gold, David. Repeat okay. what you said. That is awesome. Say it slower. Okay. An objection, an objection is not a no. It's not a no. In fact, I'll even argue that it's a buying signal, Gary. It's a buying signal. If you agree with me, and you're not moving forward immediately, then you're just, you're just appeasing me, right? But if you have an objection, now I know I got a player, right? I got a buyer. My, my heart rate goes up when you object because I'm like, heck yeah, I got an objection. This dude's a player. This guy, this gal is a player, right? So that's how you have to internalize it. That's how you get sold when you're making a call to keep hearing that, right? So I got Mr. Smith, right? He says, Dave, no, 80,000 miles. No, that's way too high. Remember, I wanted something under 50,000 miles. You know what, Gary? I get it. I totally get it. I'm right there with you. I wouldn't want a car over 50,000 miles. I never dreamed I would even call you about a car with 80,000 miles, but I just got out of this truck. You are not going to believe this. I got out of the truck. I found all the documentation. I looked at the truck. I looked at one we had that was a, a different model. I know you're not interested in, but I, one that I thought was nice that had 28,000 miles doesn't even compare to this one. This thing has been meticulously cared. I can't even find a, not even a blemish on it. it. Hey, Gary, I don't care what you do. It's okay, but you have to see this truck. You have to see it, man. I'm going to get that excited about that phone call. Why? Because I was sold on it before I got on the phone call. You see what I'm saying? So you've got to get sold. Now, when I'm talking like that, then it's going to be different, you know, and if I get more objections, it's okay, because I'll just continue to kind of go down that road. Um, so by the way, now here's the difference. Here's the difference in a salesperson and someone who's not a salesperson. 
we already knew the parameters, right? Mr. Smith wanted one with under 50,000 miles. Here comes one, a beautiful clean one with 82,000 miles. The non-salesperson will go, up, oh, doesn't work. It's not under 50,000 miles. The salesperson will go, holy crap, that's nice. I would buy that. Let me get on the phone and call Mr. Smith. You see the difference there? Yeah, it's attitude, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's just being sold and excited. Look, yeah. there's two things you're selling every single time. We all know that you have to sell yourself, right? But there's two products you're selling every day. You're selling the product that you're actually selling, the actual physical product. And you're selling yourself every single time. So if you're selling yourself, how well do you want to be observed? You know, um, anyway, there's another million lessons in that. But, um, but so here's some do's and don'ts. Um, the first thing we know that we have to be sold. The next thing that we know is that, um, you know, we want to agree with an objection. I want to agree with it. A lot of times, by the way, and here's another way to look at an objection. We already mentioned that it's not a no. In fact, it's a buying signal. But another way to think of an objection to kind of maybe help you internalize this is to think of an objection. Instead of calling it an objection, call it an observation. It's an observation. So in other words, um, uh, well, Gary, um, you know, I don't know, that, that's, a, that's an awfully short bed. Yeah, it is, man, it is, I know, I get it. It is, it is a, short, a short bed. But here, check this out. Here's one of the cool things about it because we get that a lot, but what we found, remember the old feel felt found? I understand how you feel. Others have felt the same way or I felt the same, same way till I found out. Here's one of the things, uh, Gary, that we found out about this particular uh, bed. Number one, here's the cool thing. You actually get two of the best worlds because most people buy the short beds because they're sporty, right? They're sporty, they just look good. And uh, that's why I want a, sport, a short bed, but I get it. You need the functionality of a long bed. That's why Ford came out with these bed extenders. Check this out. And then I'm going to show them the bed extenders, or I'm going to tell them about the bed extender. Have you seen that? Because that gives you that eight-foot bed instead of the six-foot bed. You get the best of both worlds. By the way, that's what people are gravitating towards. It's going to help you with resale value. This vehicle is going to cost you less. Mr. Smith, I'm going to share a lot of reasons why not just that one. That so, is cool. Neat. So, so, yeah, there's so much to sell every time you, to, you talk with someone. And, and, and when I say that, I also I always give little caveats. But... Um, you know, less is more when it comes to selling, meaning that we need to be talking less, listening more, right? Every, hopefully everyone understands that. Um, we just need to ask the right questions. So getting back to the phone call and the phone script and all that stuff, what I wanna begin to think about are two things. Um, before I pick up that phone, I wanna be sold. I wanna check my attitude. Jackie Cooper, who's an old trainer from way back when, uh, used to say, hey, uh, get a checkup from the neck up before you take it up, right? So you want to do a little checkup from the neck up before you take it up. Um, now, most people who are dealing, Gary, uh, in sales over the phone, especially if they're doing a lot of volume over the phone, meaning that, again, we go back to that business model where some people, it's just phone, phone, phone all day long, right? Well, that gets very monotonous. It gets very challenging, right? You're picking up the phone one after another. Um, in fact, the, 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 uh, uh, the company IPD, Imperial Press Direct, where uh, I'm the ho uh, host of the uh, auto show with David Villa, he has a sales team that sells campaigns to dealerships and training to dealerships. So that sales team, all they do all day long, Gary, is pick up the phone. That's all they do all day long. They probably make 100, you know, on any given day, average about 100 calls each. Uh, trying to get in touch with that dealer so that they can get an opportunity to pitch that dealer, right? So the first thing is we have to be sold. We talked about that. The next thing is that um, we, we have to internalize the fact that we don't want to sound because almost everyone does that's calling out of dealerships. They sound, Gary, like they're in a call center. We want to shake the call center uh, mentality. We also want to shake the call center sound. And there were a couple of ways to do that. One of the ways to do that, of course, is that checkup from the neck up. But one of the things that I want to remind everyone of is that you are selling to a, you are selling to a passing parade at the dealership, meaning that, um, meaning that you're doing the same thing over and over again. But the person on the other side is seeing it from the, for the first time, right? So the passing parade is, you know, hey, 
uh, when you get there, you're, you're waving the whole time, but you're there, you know, you're seeing them only uh, for the first time. So the, the theory is this, is that um, I might be tired of that speech, of that script, of that whatever the case may be, but I got to understand that it's the first time ever that the person on the other end of the line has heard it. And I've got to deliver it that way with that same excitement. Now, a couple of ways that we can do that is that I recommend standing up as often as possible, standing up, walking around, smile while you're talking. It comes through the phone. Gary, have you ever talked to someone on the phone and in your head, you imagined what that person either looked like, uh, sounded like, what they were doing at the time, right? Every one of us do that. It's a natural thing, right? So if I'm standing up and I'm smiling and I'm talking to you about it, Gary, and I'm telling you how great it is, not as a dramatic corny thing, but because I'm literally actually excited about it. I think it's really cool. Gary, I love this show, by the way. I think it's really neat what you're doing here. I love the fact that I've got David Cribbs, host of Under Auto Dealer Live, in the background, man. That is so cool. And you know what? I can say it that same way every time that you interview me, not because I'm trying to act it out, but because you know what, Gary? Seriously, dude, I think that's really cool. You've got David Cribbs, host of Under Contract or uh, Auto Dealer Live on there and Sales Dollars background. I think it's so cool, man. You see there? This, and it's not because I'm acting. I'm really not acting. Like when I go there and think about that, that's what I really think. So um, understanding how you're coming across on the phone is a big, big deal because this will take care of 90% of it. Here's, and here's the, big, here's the big thought there. When you present yourself just in that way, in a good demeanor and manner and excitement, what happens is you get a lot of grace. You get a lot of grace. I all of a sudden have even a couple more minutes than I had before to hear some of the other things that you have to offer. You see, I'm gonna get off the line quick if I'm with someone who's just dead and I feel like it's just another sales call, someone trying to get me to do uh, something, right? I'm off the phone. So. Back in the sequence of things, um, get sold, um, then get yourself prepared to actually speak in a great way and understand that they're hearing it for the first time. And then the next thing we want to do is like any good attorney, and this is one of the reasons for the scripts, but any good attorney, Gary, already knows that the answers to the questions that they're going to put out there. What we want to do is we want to ask the right questions, and that's, by the way, why we create scripts. And we want to ask them in a chronological order, meaning that we're leading somewhere. What I want to lead to is the sale. The sale in this case is the appointment. So I want to lead there. I also know that I can't get there until I've led you there, meaning that I've got to get you to that compelling reason. That compelling reason might be me. It might be the vehicle we have in stock right now. It might be the excitement. It might be the time of month. It might be anything. But whatever that compelling reason is, um, I've got to get you there. But before I can get you there, I've got to learn how to get you there. I learn how to get you there, not so much by the script. It's a great guideline, and, 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 you know, but you don't want to read it like verbatim or back again to the call center sound, right? So what I really want to think about is how can I connect with Gary? Okay, I just called Gary or Gary just called me, but how do I really connect with Gary, right? Without also, by the way, because here's another deadly mistake we can make. Gary calls in. Gary says, hey, hey, Dave, I just saw online you have this uh, vehicle. Um, can you give me a price on it? And then I say something like, yeah, Gary, great, man. I'm so glad you called, man. Uh, you know, where, where are you calling from, Gary? How's the weather there, right? That doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound good because I, it's like we're avoiding what Gary called in for, right? We don't have that rapport yet. We can ask Gary about the weather later in the conversation, right? But right now I've got to I've got to get what Gary wants quickly to make him to get his attention and go, oh my gosh, I'm calling somebody different. They actually have an answer for me. They actually are gonna help me, right? So Gary calls in, is like, Dave, hey, I see this vehicle online that you have. Can you get me a price? I'm like, absolutely, Gary. In fact, that's what, what the, I'm glad you called me because that's what I do. I'll get you the price. In fact, if you'd like any 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 other information, I can get that for you too. In fact. Uh, if you'd like a quote on payments, anything else that we that we have terms, leasing, anything. By the way, Gary, um, I see you're talking about stock number 47712. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, Dave, that's correct. Oh, 
That's great. I just want to verify because Gary, if it's okay with you, I'm going to give you a price on that exact car down to the penny out the door. Would that be all right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah. That's what I called for, right? Maybe not even expecting that. Absolutely, Gary. In fact, I'm going to put it in writing. Most dealers won't do that. They're just, you know, uh, but we, we put everything in writing here so there's no confusion um, and that helps create a better experience. We found that people just appreciate that. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, me too. Me too. You know, one of the difficult things that we're trying to overcome is, you know, obviously a lot of people, uh, when they think about even calling a dealership, much less coming in, it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, a, you know, a negative kind of thought that goes in their mind, like they're going to get their run around and stuff like that. So we do it a little differently here, Gary. Um, have you ever purchased a car here, by the way? No, no. I've heard good things about you guys, though. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to check because there's a couple things going on also for our clients. In fact, um, a couple things that we do here I'll share with you as well, but I noticed that uh, on this stock number, I just wanted to clarify, this is a brand new six cylinder with leather. Um, is, is this car going to be for you, Gary, personally? Well, it looks good to me. I, I mean, I, I, I want to do more research. Yeah, no, I meant, are you, is, are you actually the person that'll be driving it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be me for sure. Yeah. Oh, okay, great, great. Then that helps me out because there's a few things I could share with you that would be important. Um, also, Gary, real quick, I, kn I know the car is going to be for you. Are you going to be uh, using that for, do you use it for work or is it just for your personal use? Just pleasure. Just awesome. awesome. My, yeah. I love that. You know, it's a, that's so cool because uh, so many people call me and, you know, we wind up uh, doing deals on cars and, and they, they use them for business only. And sometimes I wonder if it's even the car they really want to be in, you know, because they're just getting it for work. So it's really cool, though, that, that you're doing it for for personal. Let me ask you a question, Gary, real quick also, because um, I want to send this information over to you. So let me ask you a question real quick. Do you have any vehicles yourself or even in the household that you would allow me to make an offer on? Are you talking about a trade-in? Uh, yeah, yeah. Or just buy it outright. Do you have anything that we could make you an offer on within a few minutes? Yeah, I've got an, an Infinity QX56. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So what I'm going to do there, Gary, I don't know. I'm going to pull a couple of points out of this real quick. Do you notice how I'm, I'm, do you notice how I address the price right off the bat and yet we're moving to different places pretty seamlessly? Right. Yeah, for sure. Right. Okay. Now it's knowing the right questions to ask. So did you also notice that I didn't ask if you had a trade in? I just asked if you or anyone in your house would allow us to make an offer on a car. Yeah, I see the difference. I see because I understand what you're talking about. I'm just, yeah, I, it doesn't make it seem like you're a trade in. Exactly. But, and, and, and the reason, and let's talk about the reason that I do that. The reason I do that is because if someone's calling for a price on a car, if maybe they're just price shopping me, they're going to maybe throw the trade in later, right? They've read books, they've done whatever they thought when they bought a car 10 years ago, this is what they're supposed to do. They're going to tell me about the trade later because right now they want to get the price or their buddy told them they should do this or whatever. So, what I want to do is I want to get that trade information without sounding also, by the way, it's, it's posed differently. So if you have called or you're going to call another store, which it's likely that you either already have or may, um, do I sound different? No. I mean, do, no, you sound do, different? I sound, do, do those questions sound different oh. than, oh, do you have a trade? Oh, yes. For, yeah. I mean, for sure they sound yeah. different. Yeah. So the point is, a lot of times you're going to win the customer over or the client over just in the way that you're asking questions. But what I'm really trying to do here is connect with Gary, because right. I'm going to say something like, OK, Gary, so your QX Infinity or whatever. Did you buy that new, by the way? Used. I bought it used. You did. So you saved money. I did. And I'm stoked <laughs> about saving money. I love that. I love that. So, you know, the car, it's funny because, you know, um, the car that you, uh, that we're getting the price for you on the new car, obviously that's a brand new car and that's, that's super cool. You bought used pre-owned last time to save some money. I do actually have a couple of cars that are identical to the one that you're calling in on, um, that I might be able to save you even a few thousand dollars. Some of them that actually, uh, have just a very short ownership, but actually come with a longer warranty. Is that something you would consider as well? Absolutely. Oh, great. Because I'll get you that information as well. We've got some, uh, some, some really cool things going on. That really helps, actually, because um, I'll send several things over. And one of the things that I would encourage you to do, Gary, is, and I'll kind of shorten this conversation real quick, Gary. 
But one of the things that I would uh, encourage you to do is if we look at some of those cars that are certified that have the longer warranties, because they're pre-owned, I wanna make sure that, sure that they're perfect. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna send you, as we, as, we, uh, as we end the call, I'm gonna send you an actual photo of some of those cars. And, uh, and also I wanna let you know, or, or at least make available to you, the idea that, um, that uh, there's a couple ways, different ways that you can see that car. Do you, are, do, you, did you, do you live nearby here at the dealership? Yeah, I'm, I'm about 20 minutes away. Awesome, awesome. Do you happen to have the Infinity with you? Because man, that is so cool. Do you have the Infinity? Yeah, I mean, I drive it every day. Awesome, awesome. I tell you what, I would, I would, I would be willing to do, Gary. If you can come over and bring that Infinity, not only will I give you a quote on it right away, I'll just tell you what we'll pay for it. You don't have to trade, you don't have to do anything. That's up to you, whatever you want to do there. But uh, the cool thing is I can give you what we would pay cash for it, like immediately. I can share a couple of these other cars that are exactly what you're looking for that you would be able to save thousands on. There's also, by the way, a couple of things we have going on here at the dealership, and I'm going to I'm going to leave a little bit of mystery, but there's a couple of programs we have here for the people that live locally that I'd love to share with you when you're here. Were you thinking later today around five or more like seven? Um, it can't be today. It's going to have to be a couple of days from now. It can't be today. Okay. So you're thinking Saturday. Yes. Okay. All right. Are you better in the morning or afternoon? Afternoon. I'm not a morning person. Okay. No worries. No worries. By the way, um, Gary, are you, uh, let me just ask you this real quick. I know that you live locally. Do you work here too? Do you work I nearby? Do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I'm assuming that part of the reason you come on Saturday is because you work during the week. That's correct. Awesome. Hey, let me ask you a question. I'm going to throw something out there. And if this helps you, I think it would help me a great deal in a couple of ways. And I'll share what's in it for me if you like it. Is that fair enough? Yeah, sure. Okay. So you work, you work, uh, where do you work, Gary? Um, I work for a software company. You work for a software company. Is it downtown? Downtown, yep. Okay, so we're about four miles apart. Um, what I'd love to do, Gary, is one of these, what, we already know what the new car is going to look like exactly, but one of these pre-owns that I have that has low mileage, that has the extended warranty that I could save you thousands of dollars on, um, I might even be able to save you a trip here. I'd love to come over, take a look at the Infinity because you're four miles away and uh, actually show this car to you, just let you take a peek, and I'll, sh I'll share with you what's in it for me. No obligation, but what's in it for me are two things. Number one, when I come over to your work and show you the car or share the car with you, uh, I know that there are other employees that might look out the window or even come outside, whatever the case may be, be a great opportunity for me to get to meet other people because obviously I'm in sales. Uh, but more importantly, Gary, It'll also kind of get me out of the dealership for a few minutes. Give me some fresh air. I would love that. So no obligation to you. How about I run it by around four o'clock this afternoon? I'll have about 15 minutes. And by the way, I cannot stay for more than about 10 or 15 minutes. Is that okay? That's great. Awesome. Okay. I'll bring it over. Let me get your address. One, two, three, a one, two, three okay. main street. Okay. So, so the idea there, Gary, is, uh, you know, not every situation is like that where you can maybe get that or, you know, but the idea is you always ask, you always ask. So what I, what I talked about earlier is I know where I have to go in order to make things happen. I'm going to let you kind of fill me in so that I can put the pieces together as I walk through that conversation. But if you're not coming in till Saturday, that's okay. I'll book the appointment for Saturday. But if today is Wednesday, I don't want to wait till Saturday because you're going to call someone else tomorrow right. and you're going to run into a salesperson. Right. And you're going to run into a salesperson that offers to bring it over to your office. So, um, so that's a great way. And by the way, those other benefits that I mentioned, I'm sold on. I'm sold on the fact that if I come over to your place of business, I get another shot at somebody seeing me, right? I'm also sold on the fact that I do want to get out of the dealership for 20 minutes, go right. get in a brand new car and ride over, ride around and maybe stop on the way back at Starbucks, right? I want to get out, I want to do stuff, right? So, so I'm already sold on those things. So when I deliver them, and by the way, you noticed before I even asked for that appointment or asked to come by, I shared with Gary that I was going to tell him what was in it for me, right? Right. I want it to make sense. I'm like, you know, and I want to take them off the hook, by the way, also like feeling obligated. You also notice I said, Gary, Gary, if I come, I can only stay about 10 minutes. Is right. that okay? Yep. 
Yep. Now, now Gary's thinking, oh yeah, he's just coming to show me the car. Right. Am I going to stay 10 minutes or am I, or am I going to stay an hour if I can? Well, you're going to stay an hour and close the deal if you can. Exactly. 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 So anyway, so those are, that's just one little scenario. But the idea there is that, you know, there's a couple of things that have to take place on the phone. Forget the script. Think about what that has to happen on a phone conversation. What has to happen is we have to get their attention. We have to connect. We have to make them feel like we're delivering solutions. And then eventually we have to go for the close and we have to set that appointment. That is awesome stuff. That was so cool. I've never even thought about or heard of anybody coming to a, 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 a dealership at a dealership, driving a car to me and letting me look at it. I mean, that is nobody. I've never even heard of that. That's just such a great idea. And your script was awesome. I mean, it really was. I love the part where you said, I can only be there for 10 minutes. And what, what you're telling them is, is, hey, I'm busy. I'm, I'm a busy person. I'm, you know, I have a lot of sales coming through. I only have 10 minutes. Um, um, so, and that does a couple things. That builds that rapport. It builds trust, but it lets them know that you're successful. But it also lets them be at ease because, um, you know, they know that they're in for 10 minutes and you have to go after that. Um, so that is just awesome stuff. Um, let me ask you one last question, David. Sure. If there's a realtor, I mean, I'm sorry, if there's a dealership that is struggling and if there is a dealership that is, that, that is hurting for sales and there's one thing that you've learned in your long experience that can be the most helpful thing to them, what would that thing be? Something that you, if you would have known 20 years ago, that would have made you more successful, that one thing, what is that one thing that you can think of that is going to help a dealership today? Sure, I can give you those four things, Gary. <laughs> okay, all right, four, four things quickly, but I want, I'm curious about the number one, though, but okay, let's go through the four things. I'll be honest with you, man. Number one, number one is the sold thing. You got to be sold on wow. everything that you're doing. You have to be sold on everything that you're doing. As a manager, I'm sold on how I desk the deals, how I deal with, uh, or how I manage or you know partner with and serve. By the way, my people, um, I've got to be sold on the position that I'm in. Um, I have another blog, by the way, and I'll share it at another time. But um, the blog is uh, the number one position in the dealership, the best job in the dealership. And I go through each position in the dealership and you realize quickly that it is, every position is the best position in the dealership. Because just like a car, I can pull everything that is amazing out of it and all the reasons why that is the one, right? So it's the same with the position. So number one rule, always, 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 you've got to be sold before you can sell. And I don't care what that is or what you're selling, even if it's a philosophy you're selling, you've got to be sold, right? So number one, uh, the number two thing I would say, um, and, and this is going to go sort of, and I'm going to take my jacket off because this is kind of hot. Um, <laughs> this next one I'm going to throw out there is kind of hot, man. Uh, so the next one I'm going to say is communication. And when I say communication, I'm going to make it very clear what I mean by that. And, 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 and um, communication is, we all know, we've all heard the trickle down theory, what you know, your business is going to look like, what it looks like at the top, all those things. But one of my biggest things that I see with dealers and dealerships is the lack of communication from the top. In other words, um, you know, there's certain things to be said about delegation, but there's other things to, to be said about someone who's present. I always say there's nothing sexier in the world than a GM or an owner that's engaged with his dealership or her dealership. There's nothing sexier, right? And what I mean by that is um, I should know a weekend, I should know what this store is all about, what the mission is, how we're getting there, what the vision is, how we're doing it together, how every department interacts, how we, how we put the pieces of the puzzle together, right? I need to be, so I, that is communication from the top down. So, and you asked me to set this up by the question you said was, 
what about dealerships that are struggling for sales or struggling, you know, to make it better? And I'm going to say this, every single dealership, no matter how many cars are on the board are struggling for sales. And here's how I know that. I know that when I see a store that's kicking butt for five, 10 years, I mean, killing it, right? And for some reason, some weird, odd, funky reason, they bring a new person in to this amazingly successful store that's kicking booty, that has been bragging for years, and this new person takes them to a new level. And they're selling three times that. And no one could have had imagined that. They, they could have imagined it at the dealership down the road that was only selling 150, how they needed to get to 300. But how do you take a store that's selling 600 every month and take them to 1200, right? So every dealership is struggling, they just don't know it. Right. So, right. Um, so number one is sold. Number two is communication. And, and I guess number three would be to be thinking in terms of that, that the, the opportunities that you're missing. Look, we've been in the heyday in the car business for the last five or six years. Okay, there was a, we know about the big downturn. We've been in the heyday. We're, I'm, not, I'm not gloom or doom, but I am saying be ready because the, 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 the footprint is quickly changing. There's a couple of things going on, Gary, that I'll throw out there real fast. Um, we have technology, so we have disruptors coming into the marketplace. Place, cars like Carvana, now Amazon is talking. All these places that we thought would never be players are players all of a sudden, right? So um, the business model hasn't changed that much, but it is going to start looking a little differently. Another thing that we have to think about is the fact that we have ridden this wave for such a long time, right? Repossessions, by the way, in subprime are headed back up. They're going back up at alarming rates. That's another flag. Um, then the third thing I would share with you is that um, – Bigger corporations, bigger groups of auto dealers are buying up smaller ones like crazy. So the point is the, the, the playground is changing a little bit. So if I'm a dealer or an owner or a GM, I'm looking at those things. I'm looking at those things and I'm preparing not only for today, because in the car business, we worry about what's right in front of us right now. Um, but the true dealers, the true ones that are, are really excelling and have staying power, are focused greatly on the things that are happening right now, but they're also focused on all the things that are happening tomorrow. So I would encourage them to look at that. That's great stuff, David. And, you know, thank you for being on today. What great information. And, you know, this is great sales stuff. You know, you talked about enthusiasm. You know, this, I've, I always heard a long time ago that a sale is nothing but a transfer of enthusiasm. And you went over that and a, a lot of other stuff. But, you know, this is great information that not just a car dealership can use, but, you know, also realtors or insurance agents or anything that, um, you know, that, 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 that anybody can use. We have a lot of clients in, in different markets at sales dialers and, um, and um, they can use this information and, um, and, you know, and, 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 and launch stuff and get it going. So that's great information. David, one last thing, tell us how people can reach out to you if they wanted to um, um, get further information from you or maybe consulting or anything like that. Share that with us right now. Thank you. I do appreciate that. So um, they can find me um, on Twitter at Desking Deals. Uh, my email is Desking Deals. And by the way, that's obviously a car term. Uh, Desking Deals at gmail.com. Um, I'm also, as you know, a part of Auto Dealer Live. And, um, uh, and you'll see me at the big conferences. Um, I know NADA is going on right now. Um, I, I was unable to make that one, but I will be at Digital Dealer in Orlando, April 10th, 11th, and 12th, which, by the way, are you going to be there, Gary? I think we will be there for sure, yeah. Oh, so we'll get together. Awesome. That will be awesome, awesome. Um, in fact, we'll be doing interviews. We'll be roaming around on the floor. If you're in the auto business and you happen to be at that conference, um, you know, make sure that you find us. We'll also, I know that uh, my uh, partner on the show, the host, David Villa, he'll be actually moderating a keynote He's the opening keynote, if I'm not mistaken, with a bunch of dealers on the panel, kind of a round robin table discussion with dealers. It's going to be amazing. But yes, uh, deskingdeals at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at deskingdeals. You can also follow me uh, at Auto Dealer Live. Uh, and my phone number, by the way, if you want to have a conversation, if you're a dealer, I still actively today go into dealerships for sales trainings. Um, I can, you know, 
help in any way. And by the way, I won't come in and tell you that I'm an expert in, in something I'm not. So if there's an area that you're struggling with that I cannot uh, confidently say for sure, hey, this is what we can do here, um, I will get you the person that can uh, confidently make that happen. So, um, uh, so we have access to the top people all over the country as, as a result of the show. And uh, my personal phone number is 813-526-2861. It's Dave wow. Fritz. Awesome, David. Well, thank you again for being on the show. And uh, we just want to say, gosh, great stuff. And we're going to have you on again, if you, if you don't mind. It was just great tidbits of great sales stuff. So thank you for being on today. And you have a great day. Thank you, Gary.